Uh, Bulavinak, everyone. Uh, snack from the top. Uh, my name is Epeli, and I'm joining you today from Suva Fiji uh, with the Pacific Network on Globalization. And, and I'd like to thank you for, for taking the time to join us for today's webinar. Uh, just briefly, uh, we're, we're now 10 minutes in, so uh, there may be others that will join in this call along the way, but uh, We'll head straight into today's program so that we're able to wrap up within um, one and a half hours. Uh, so today's webinar is, is titled uh, Defending the Spirit of Rarotonga. And uh, it comes off the back of a uh, discussion paper series that Pang has, has titled uh, Eroding the Spirit of a Nuclear Free Pacific. And this uh, discussion paper series examines the recent shifts in the Pacific region that have uh, largely been driven by the geopolitical competition between the United States and its allies and China. Uh, this has led to a reframing of the uh, Pacific region as part of the Indo-Pacific, um, which has included things like the announcement of the AUKUS Security Pact um, and the proposed nuclear submarines um, and greater military alignment uh, by Australia with the United States uh, military as well. Uh, this has undermined the disarmament and non-proliferation uh, efforts and has resulted in what is seen as a, an erosion of uh, the spirit of a nuclear free Pacific. Um, just for your information, we've recently published our third discussion paper in this, in this uh, series, uh, which is available on our website, and our team will be sure to share uh, the links with you um, on, on, um, on the chat and also via email. Um, and, and just briefly, this, this discussion paper uh, outlines the security priorities articulated by Pacific Island countries at a regional level and asks what to what extent and in what ways AUKUS and this Indo-Pacific framing uh, addresses these priorities. Particular attention is being paid to the implications that AUKUS has for the rules-based security, security, nuclear security order in the region, um, and most notably uh, the Rarotonga Treaty, which we're here to talk about um, this afternoon. Yeah. So off the back of uh, you know, the, Pacific, the recent Pacific Island Leaders Forum meeting in Rarotonga, uh, tropical cyclones in Vanuatu and Fiji today, uh, we, we have three speakers uh, joining us with a breadth of, of knowledge and experience on disarmament and, um, and the Pacific's nuclear free history and, mm -hmm. and, and status. So um, just, just briefly, we have Oliver Lilford, uh, Marco De Jong and Joey Tao, um, who you'll see ahead of you. And uh, just a brief um, format of today's webinar, we'll, we'll have a roundtable discussion. Each speaker will be given seven to 10 minutes to make a brief intervention before we open up the floor for comments and questions uh, from you, our audience, this afternoon. Uh, this Zoom meeting is being recorded, and so we ask that you kindly mute your microphones uh, we're not speaking and use the raised hand function when wanting to ask a question or comment. And so with those few um, introductory remarks, I now hand over to, to Oliver to make his, um, his intervention. Binaka. Binaka Vakalev, Epeli. Um, and good, well, good afternoon to you all. Good morning from here. Oh, actually, no, just talked over. Good afternoon from here. Um, I'm calling from Nam, Melbourne, so I'd like to begin before I start speaking with an acknowledgement of the traditional owners of this land that I'm calling on, um, calling from, the Wiradjuri, Woiwurrung, and the Bunurong peoples of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Um, so as Ellie said, um, Pang has just released these papers, and I'm going to be drawing uh, on my for my intervention, drawing on that that last paper mostly um, that's just come out. Recently, and I, I really want to sort of zoom in, given the times, um, zoom into the Rarotonga Treaty, and 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 look at, I guess, this uh, set up maybe what I what I've understood to be the spirit of the Rarotonga Treaty, um, and where maybe some of the legal um, the clauses within it, the actual technical legal 
uh, clauses that it sets up fall short slightly of that of that spirit and how AUKUS really is exploiting some of those um, legal uh, loop or not loopholes but gaps um, in between the spirit and the actual um, uh, legality of the Rarotonga Treaty in order to progress a sort of nuclear militarized agenda in, in concert with the US. Um, and so we know really that the Rarotonga Treaty emerged from um, this, this powerful movement within the Pacific um, in, in protesting the, the horrors of the social and environmental the horrors of nuclear testing um, and, and really sets up um, uh, a, a concern, a really deep-seated concern for the environmental contamination of nuclear testing and dumping. Um, an outrage over the this, this is severe and, and long-lasting health impacts. Um, Pacific peoples have suffered and continue to suffer from radioactive fallout from nuclear tests. Deep concerns over the dangers that nuclear weapons and the possibility of conflict, of their use in conflict, posed to regional peace and stability. And that came around at a time of heightened geopolitical competition between the US and the USSR, which we're seeing echoes of um, today. And also, it came from a strong desire to bolster international disarmament agreements. Um, and although so there was generally strong uh, opposition, of course, across to nuclear weapons and nuclear testing and nuclear waste dumping among Pacific and Australian governments, um, certain states led um, most, uh, like, uh, I guess, prominently by Australia, were also keen to balance their opposition to um, nuclear weapons and nuclear technologies with their relationship with the US and sought to limit the scope of the nuclear treaty that was being negotiated at the time in order to preserve those security relationships. While others, other states like Vanuatu, the Solomon Islands and PNG were in intent on having the strongest possible anti-nuclear provisions within the text. And so when it was brought to um, the final negotiation, um, the, the text represented something of a, of a, um, of a compromise and it was brought forward by Australia and envisioned a treaty that would meet the minimum requirements of a nuclear free zone, but without significantly altering US security interests. Um, that being the free movement of nuclear powered and nuclear armed vessels and aircraft through the waters of the Pacific and their capacity to, um, to dock and make use of facilities across the Pacific and particular, particularly in Australia. Um, uh, because of the long-standing security relationship between the two. And so there are several important exemptions then that undermine that. That's the, the, the real um, kind of spirit of Rarotonga that comes through uh, quite clearly in the, in the preamble. Um, and the first one of them being this, well, I, in my opinion, maybe the most important one being um, an ambiguity on what is defined as, as stationing. Um, and Article 5 of the Rarotonga Treaty sets very clear, um, what, what sets quite clear limits on the stationing um, of nuclear explosive devices um, and states that each, um, each party must prevent the stationing of any nuclear explosive device in its territory, but that each party remains free to decide for itself whether to allow visits by foreign ships and aircraft to its ports, airfields, transit through its airspace by foreign aircraft and navigation by foreign trips in its territorial sea or archipelago um, or archipelagic waters um, that might be carrying nuclear weapons and define stationing in that context as the implantation, emplacement, transportation on land or waters, the stockpiling, storage or installation and deployment of, of nuclear weapons, or in this case, vessels and aircraft that might be armed with nuclear weapons. However, it does so with a notable absence of a threshold in terms of what might be the duration of, of that, of particular acts and their repetition. And so since the, since the Rarotonga Treaty came into force, the US has sort of exploited this particular ambiguity in order to conduct visits um, to Australia uh, and repeated visits with nuclear armed vessels or aircraft um, and 
claims the right to visit and therefore avoid the uh, the consequence of being uh, considered stationing nuclear weapons um, in uh, in Australia. And Australia has gone along with this by playing into the US government's policy of neither confirming nor denying the presence of nuclear weapons on their vessels or aircraft. Um, and the reason that this takes on such a particular significance today is because of the Australian government's sort of recent commitments in two aspects, one connected with AUKUS and one connected more broadly with their um, sort of militarization agenda with the US to begin moving beyond the idea of just foreign vessels visiting um, with, and foreign aircraft visiting to actually becoming a host for US um, nuclear submarines in the um, uh, naval port uh, in Western Australia and for US nuclear capable bombers in the Northern Territory. And so this, this marks quite a, an important um, move away from the ability to claim a simple visit by US um, ships to actually serving um, US military operational requirements. And it raises some really important questions about whether that can now be considered an active stationing, particular, particularly with the aircraft. So um, there are plans in order to sort of permanently rotate through the Northern Territory Air for, um, airfields, uh, new US nuclear um, bombers which really sort of represents a, a sort of, um, yeah, quite a significant step in, in um, US military strategic operations. So along with that comes these important questions about whether it, it raises a, a problem for Australia's commitment to not station nuclear weapons. So I, I feel like I've sort of narrowed quite, quite deeply and uh, sharply and deeply down to that particular point, but I think that that's quite, a, quite an important um, aspect of it all. I'm not sure we can maybe bring out um, more aspects of it as we go through. Um, there are certainly some other um, exemptions and limitations and other ways that AUKUS is, is um, undermining sort of regional security priorities. Um, but maybe I should I should pass over to Marco so I don't take the floor for too long. Um, but thank you. Vinaka, Vinaka Valuable, Oliver, you set a, a solid foundation, I think, from which to, to build upon. So, uh, Marco, uh, when you're ready, uh, we're happy to hear from you. Vinaka. Vinaka Peli, and thank you, Oliver, and everybody else at PANG for, one, organizing this webinar, two, inviting, um, you know, comment from outside, and three, producing the wonderful papers that um, I'm sure we all agree uh, give a really comprehensive look into some of the nuclear issues and and offer a Pacific, um, a foundation for a Pacific critique of um, especially Australia's conduct when it comes to, you know, the spirit and even the letter of the Treaty of the Rarotonga. Um, I thought just reflecting on what Oliver said, um, I might just talk briefly about um, what happened at the most, um, the recently concluded forum um, leaders meeting um, that was also held in Rarotonga with these historic parallels. Um, then maybe move into and just kind of break down what was in the communique um, and then kind of move into some two kind of emergent threats or things to watch when we think about the ways that this might go forward. Um, so first, when we um, and I'd just like to acknowledge my colleague, um, Tale Mangione, who accompanied me um, to, well, we, we, we went together to Rarotonga and um, observed um, the goings on of the forum and we're very conscious. Tale couldn't be here today because she's with ANU's field school in Sydney, but she sent through a list of her comments too, which I hope to um, represent too in, in the feedback here. I think the overriding feeling um, was one of, you know, at, at um, the leaders retreat especially, was this, was this uncertainty as to what the revitalization of the Treaty of Aratonga might look like. Earlier in the week, um, on the Monday of the Pacific Islands Forum, Prime Minister uh, Mark Brown of the Cook Islands signaled his intent to re revitalize, was the word he used, the Treaty of Aratonga. So we, we were, you know, cautiously optimistic that they might, you know, for example, push for the universalization to bring the, you know, the US compact states in. 
um, push for the strengthening of the wording to close some of those loopholes or, or um, have tighter definitions around the technicalities that allow this ambiguity around stationing that Oliver um, laid out so comprehensively. Um, or potentially, you know, open it up or, or offer some other things because there's also um, language in there around um, dumping, you know, so um, when we think about the spirit of Haratonga and it being a lens through which the region engages nuclear issues as a whole, um, that kind of way of looking at it, the spirit as, as, as impelling the Pacific to um, giving it a moral obligation to, to refuse nuclearism in light of the, in the nuclear legacy and in light of the, um, the, the region's longstanding commitment to ocean health um, and for victim assistance and some immediate uh, environmental remediation through instruments like the TPNW and the Namir Convention and things like that. Um, you know, the spirit is is more than simply the um, kind of ambitious text and non-binding text in the preamble. It's It reflects the historical process to which... Um, by which the treaty came about. Um, and we should also bear in mind that the, tr the Treaty of Arutonga and the forum was not the original vehicle for a South Pacific nuclear free zone. And actually, you know, if you look at the text of the Namir Convention and earlier, um, you know, attempts towards signing that, we see that the Pacific had always conceived of a comprehensive nuclear free zone. Um, and Oliver mentions this, this the, the particular, um, stances of all of the different Pacific nations. You can see in Greg Fry's work the, the different ways that the Pacific nations fell on the issue. But in later support for the TPNW and ongoing support for things like the revitalization, um, we see that Pacific nations by and large continue to maintain a consensus on nuclear issues that is abolitionist. Um, and that was the point that Talay wanted me to make, is that there's an increasing distance between Australia, which relies on um, you know security through nuclear deterrence, and then the Pacific expanded concept of security and um, idea of nuclear abolition. So, going back to the leaders meeting, we were cautiously you know optimistic, interested to see what it could um, could entail. Um, on the beach, um, on or to wharf um, in Aitutaki, uh, we asked Prime Minister Brown again, you know what what it might look like. And I also asked him about the historic parallels between potentially Albanese and um, Bob Hawke, who watered down in the way that Oliver mentioned the original treaty in 85, also in the Rotonga, um, to have the holes around the transit of nuclear weapons and um, you know the nuclear propulsion. Um, so he answered that he um, he actually he laughed and said that he um, that he wouldn't dare compare Albanese to Bob Hawke, which was a hilarious moment because then he was quickly scrambling because it was clear that he didn't think Albanese's that guy, uh, like Bob Hawke was that guy. But, um, you know, then he quickly clarified that, no, Albanese is a very um, kind and nice guy and that's not what I meant kind of thing, which was pretty funny. But uh, it's, it was unclear when leaders went into the retreat what it might look like. Declassified documents from the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, obtained from the Forum Foreign Ministers meeting give an idea that the paper that the Forum Secretariat produced and tabled at the closed plenary of the leaders meeting um, mentions that maybe the, the paper that the Forum Secretariat produced on AUKUS doesn't necessarily engage the full gamut of issues, but, um, sorry, on Aramatonga doesn't engage the full gamut of issues on AUKUS in particular, and it might focus on Fukushima. Um, but the New Zealand response to the paper um, is headlined by the idea of universalization um, and operation. So the compliance with the text of the treaty. And so if we go to the actual communique, we can look and we can see a number of positives that are, arose from it. The first positive is that um, you know parties noted that that you know there's reporting requirements under the treaty if someone's circumstances change that if there's a significant event in someone's jurisdiction um, that they have to uh, inform the other you know um, keep keep each other signed parties informed of matters arising in or in relation to the treaty. So a significant matter may, for example, be the station and it'd be fifty two kilometers in the Northern Territory. Um, and then they again promoted the full compliance. This is the, this is the, the language of the text. Um, 
and then again mentioned the idea of the blue pacific and we understand that to mean an expanded notion of security um and accordance with international law um and you know so there was interesting language around compliance around that so that you know that's a positive again this point on universalization the compact states for example and then the urging the strong language on urging the united states to ratify the um, the treaty protocols, um, which obviously if we go back to what Oliver was saying, the compromise that Pacific nations took in 85 was to, um, on at the behest of New Australia, um, encouraged by New Zealand, was that they would accept this compromise on the assurance that the US would sign and it was better that the US were in than out. Obviously, the US never ratified the protocols and despite constant assurances that they would, um, most famously in 2012, also in Rarotonga, when Hillary Clinton said that they would. Um, there's been numerous congressional delegations that have toured the Pacific in the 90s, also always recommending to the to Congress that um, that they that they sign that they have ratified the, the protocol. So uh, again, we, there's this pressure on the US, um, and so again, that's that's positive because Albanese was asked earlier in the week by Nick McClellan. Uh, whether he would join calls to encourage the US. And he didn't. He said that he wasn't going to lecture the US and that his focus was on Australia. And he believed that Australia's um, activity was compliant with Rarotonga. That was, to me, a very shameful response, given what Bob Hawke did in 85. And given that, that is the loophole, those are the loopholes or gaps um, that Australia is relying on to acquire nuclear submarines and or station uh, B-52s. So I felt that it was a cop-out and given um, Albanese's support, prior indicated support for the TPNW, that he would not even encourage, you know, the, the cons regional consensus position on a, a treaty that the, that Australia is a signatory to, um, you know, indicates the degree to which Australia is A, committed to AUKUS and B, in uh, like a, a servile position. Um, frankly. And so um, when the communique then urged uh, the US, um, you know, after, say, the 2022 Pacific Leaders Summit in Washington, I think I think maybe the 2023 one didn't mention it, but you can see that, you know, there was a bit of a push, probably a bit of a pushback, because I'm not sure Albanese an anticipated um, that, that language in particular. So those are the positives. The big negative immediately follows that, which was that in the forum communique, um, effectively, it greenlit um, Australia's conduct. Um, so it, it, it was fell short of a pure endorsement, but it welcomed, this is the quote, welcomed the transparency of Australia's efforts and commitment to compliance with international law. And, and then it notes a, a series of treaties. So it's very um, disappointing, even distressing language, given, um, you know, Australia gave an update in the closed plenary session on AUKUS. We don't know the text of that. Um, and given that Minister Pat Conroy had made comments to media during the week that he had been in bilaterals all week, talking um, and reassuring Pacific counterparts that Australia's conduct was compliant. So um, Australia got the win there. Um, so that was the, the text of the communique. In the forum, in the um, post leaders retreat forum press conference, um, we got a question asked, um, to do with whether the the um, B-52 stationing had been brought up during the leaders retreat. It was answered by um, Fiji's Prime Minister Steveni Rambuka and he said that there had been no discussion of B-52 stationing at the leaders retreat. To us this was a very disappointing outcome um, and puts a bit of a dampener on the otherwise good you know otherwise starter language on compliance and operation. Um, given that, you know, that's probably the major threat to the the regime of uh, the Rarotonga nuclear-free regime is the precedent that that Australia turning the blind eye to constant stationing of nu nuclear weapons and, you know, threatens to make that the, the whole regime like a paper, a paper nuclear-free zone. And there are several examples of those or, or domestic um, legislation worldwide, like in Japan, for example, where they just turn a blind eye to... And, um, to the presence of nuclear weapons in their territories, um, in their territory. So th that that would be a good, great, great concern, and and it raises the question of PNG under the US PNG Defense Pact, and the question of Lombrum and the and the forward porting of nuclear submarines, and all of these questions. You know, so that they wouldn't go hard on this particular issue, which is the definitely the thin end of the wedge for eroding the the ac an actual nuclear free Pacific for sure. Um, so. 
that's kind of a little update about um, what happened at the Forum Leaders Retreat. I might pause there. I have further comments on um, New Zealand's role in um, AUKUS Pillar 2 and also um, Rambuka's Zone of Peace, which we might touch on later. But I think that, you know, that's a nice package that maybe we can turn to Joey for his comment. He was also there. And uh, yeah, so um, yeah, Fafata Telelaba. Thank you very much, Marco, for, 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 for giving us that brief on, on Lido's forum and, and some of the uh, positives, but also some of the concerning concerning language and discussions that came about as well. Um, we now invite Joey to make his his um, a response to both Oliver um, and Marco's uh, interventions. Inaka, Joey. Uh, thank you very much, Epeli. Thank you, Oliver, and thank you, Marco. Not so much a response, but maybe just obs some observations on the Leaders Forum, but also how the region is at, at some point struggling to safeguard a space, and as in terms of uh, the issue of nuclear uh, nuclear legacy issues, but also rising threats. And as Marco did allude to the historical process of how the Rarotonga Treaty came about, I think it is one of the, maybe the foundations that informs regional solidarity in the, in the Pacific or regionalism, however you'd like to put it. But it is the basis that portrays how the Pacific at, at, at some point in history, um, you know, collectively with an understanding to protect the region, uh, also acknowledging the legacy issues. Um, and come this forum or the process that led to this forum and how agendas in, in terms of in, in relation to the, the issues of nuclear arising threats or nuclear legacy issues. I think it's it's turned in um what's the right term for it? It it's it's had its mixture of how the the, the forum secretariat or this regional institution has facilitated some of this, this, this agenda issues or setting the agenda for our leaders. Maybe just to draw back to the foreign ministers, but prior to that, the foreign economic ministers who had the opportunity or rather were briefed by Australia uh, throughout the process in where the leaders had uh, met in Rarotonga. Uh, there were certain pre uh, presentations by the Australian delegation delegation in the economic ministers forum, but also the foreign ministers that is supposed to set, set the agenda. <clears throat> uh, some backstory to that, there was some really strong opposition from some of our Pacific states um, calling or rather had serious reservation on Australia proposing that the leaders endorse uh, the AUKUS uh, security pack uh, come Rarotonga this year. So you would have seen, I know there are different interpretations as to how AUKUS um, and how um, the issue of Fukushima have projected on the outcomes of the leaders as uh, communicate. But I think there is a growing reservation from some of our Pacific states in terms of how they perceive AUKUS uh, at the forum leaders or at the foreign Forum Foreign Ministers Meeting, uh, Australia was put to task to provide further consultations around the security pact. So there is still concerns and reservations from our leaders, and it will be interesting to see how Australia, however it wishes to propose this idea of AUKUS in the region, um, there is this reservation from our leaders, and it will be interesting to see how the region takes it forward. The same could be said for Fukushima, uh, another rising threat that uh, how the region is split on this issue where some leaders uh, are calling for Japan's, you know, reconsidering its, its, its actions on disposing or rather dumping of nuclear treated water into the Pacific Ocean and others who respect the bilateral or the diplomatic relations that they have with, with, with Japan. But drawing back to the region, I think in terms of the issues of nuclear be it nuclear legacy or rising nuclear threats, we can, you can see that the region is really struggling to facilitate and how can we approach or address some of these issues through a standing, long-standing treaty that the region has 
there are calls to review the Rotoma Treaty, so it, it, it accommodates legacy issues, the issues of compensation, the issues of environment responsibility, but also remediation. <clears throat> but how do you do it in a in the geo, you know, the current geopolitics that the region is caught has is currently caught in or is in bed with. Uh, so you would see that some of our member states are now looking at how best they could address the issue. Um, if, if if the forum is not able to facilitate or to have some very strong firm positions, either be it AUKUS or be it Fukushima, uh, we are looking at, uh, you know, at external platforms. And you would note in the latest forum that the Marshall Islands um, passed a res or adopted a resolution uh, through, uh, through the UN Human Rights Council on the basis of human rights implications, and these are legacy issues. So these are clear actions that, yes, we are acknowledged around on the treaty. It, many of our leaders over the years have referred to it as one of our, you know, our strongest basis of regional solidarity. But if we are not able to, you know, come together as a region and address legacy issues but also how do we respond to rising threats, be it Fukushima or AUKUS, you have member states looking at other platforms uh, as to how best we could um, address these arising issues. Uh, so the, the actions taken by Marshall Islands is one great one, um, but also civil society who are constantly asking for um, the re review of engagement. I think it draws back to, and we draw it back to the right of the treaty. If, 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 be it member states or member state parties to the right on a treaty or state parties to the forum, dialogue partners to the forum who disrespect the fundamental, um, fundamental, you know, the, what informs the forum or what informs regionalism, um, you know, that there was one that civil society had also call, called out in regards to Japan. Uh, if it disrespects the the spirit of the forum and what the forum stands for, uh, there was this call to have Japan suspended, and I think the same could be called for um, for Australia. But you can easily see that some of our leaders have serious reservations, um, be it arising threats, but also how do we go back to address legacy issues of nuclear testing? Maybe I'll keep it at that and we can open it up questions or conversation, a uh, dialogue. Thank you, Apelli. Thank you, Joey. Um, thank you so much uh, for, for that contribution. Uh, before um, I open up the floor, uh, two questions. Did, uh, did any of the gentlemen want to respond to any of each other's um, uh, interventions or comments? Um, or add on uh, anything further that uh, that they might have uh, missed. I'm sure Tale would like me to say that um, off the back of what Joe was saying about you know um, avenues outside of the forum for advancing the Pacific strong consensus on on nuclear issues to again um, you know give a bit of a boost to the TPNW as one, universalizing the TPNW amongst Pacific nations, and then by extension, putting pressure on Australia to sign uh, and ratify. So I think that that, that would be one um, further way. And I think that if we look at the resolution that Kiribati and Kazakhstan recently got in the UNGA around uh, victim assistance and environmental remediation, I think that's another example um, of that, that line. And there's a mention in the communique of I'm not sure I have the text of that particular part right here, but about um, multilateral um, avenues. Um, and, and that um, has been read by some to be a, a um, closet reference to the TPNW as, as another way. So um, yeah, so I just, I just thought I'd make sure, sure that Tale's notes are represented in, in, our, um, in our chat today. Yeah. Back to you, Billy. Thanks, Marco. And and for for our viewers uh, on the call that might not know what the TPNW is, it's it's the short acronym for the Treaty on the Prohibition of uh, Nuclear Weapons. Um, the a meeting uh, which will be happening in New York at the end of this week, going into next week. Um, Oliver. Yeah, I was. Thank you, Billy. I was just going to jump on what Marco was saying before as well, and. Um, 
Australia sort of in relation to the TPNW, the fact that Australia is not only sort of reliant on um, uh, a nuclear deterrent strategy for its for its security by the US, but but plays a really crucial role in actually supporting that that strategy with various infrastructural um, supports um, for sort of the for maintaining um, the what the N triple I the um, nuclear intelligence and and um, various other aspects of of kind of the infrastructure required to to maintain a nuclear threat and and the need to I guess call out Australia on on that because I feel like it's a um, those working close to the issue would would be very much aware but I'd say that m- much of the Australian public is not aware um, of the the depth um, of of Australia's entanglement with um, the US kind of nuclear triad and the role. The crucial role that it plays and may you know expanding role that it might be continue to play and and what um that might represent uh to a threat as a threat to perhaps the um the tpnw if australia was to sign it without um addressing some of those more structural support issues uh a structural um uh yeah i guess more structural issues when it comes to the to the to the use and the supporting of the use of um nuclear weapons um Thank you. Just on that on that on that um point about nuclear enabling states, um, I think that might be a good segue into this this particular part about AUKUS and AUKUS Pillar Two. Um, for those that don't know, AUKUS Pillar Two, if AUKUS Pillar One is is centres around the Australian acquisition of nuclear um propelled by conventionally armed submarines, AUKUS Pillar Two relates to the transfer of advanced technologies and the linking of the military industrial bases of the Anglosphere. Um. And it, the membership of AUKUS Pillar 2 is, is proposed to be broader than merely Australia, the US and the UK and spread potentially to New Zealand, Japan, Canada and potentially South Korea. Um, and AUKUS Pillar 2, um, the, the advanced technologies that are being touted are, are, are branded as non-nuclear. Um, and so the, for non-nuclear weapon states like the ones I've mentioned um this is a way of you know broadening the the AUKUS you know what is a a secure a a security pact or or webs of alliances um beyond and and but in a supporting role because all of the technologies um across you know cyber technology um hypersonic missiles um advanced autonomous um tech and um ai developments they're all meant to be kind of destabilizing uh, technologies that produce a new arms race to contain China, as as well as the threat of you know of of advancing the island chain down below to Papua New Guinea and and Australia and and containing it that way. The idea is that with you create this new arms race with all of these destabilizing techs and and all of that expertise is you know located amongst these increasingly uh, integrated um, military industrial bases across. Um, you know the the West or the traditional Western alliance, and more specifically uh, um, uh, the Anglosphere. But um, New Zealand was invited to join um, in apparently in March. But after uh, declassified reports from New Zealand revealed that you know New Zealand was actively con- constructing a role for itself a month after the uh, um, announcement of the alliance in, in September of 2021. So uh, New Zealand is currently. Ex- Ex- quote, you know, um, exploring what AUKUS Pillar 2 may mean or offer to New Zealand on a non-commitments basis, a no-commitments basis. Um, in July, I think, of this year, um, Australian PM Anthony Albanese and US Secretary of State Anthony Blinken um, visited New Zealand and they had talks about AUKUS. Um, and this came freshly off the bat of a range of... Um, reports released by our um, Defence Ministry of Foreign Affairs and spy agencies, which kind of set an agenda for New Zealand um, reorienting its defence force from being kind of a low-tech dual civilian or humanitarian assistance and disaster response kind of um, force that was focused on the New Zealand realm, um, you know, New Zealand, Cook Islands, um, UA and Tokelau and the South Pacific um, towards being one that is, um, you know, high-tech, combat-ready, interoperable with AUKUS powers and able to be deployed at, at, at longer distance. Um, 
And, and you know, the implication there was that there would be a rise in defense spending to, you know, the NATO standard of 2%. And, and it kind of set this agenda that people, again, were saying that, you know, this could be a pre, uh, like the a set an agenda for joining AUKUS. Um, then, so we, we're currently still in this moment where New Zealand is considering um, membership of AUKUS Pillar 2. I could speak at length about <laughs> speculation as to the new incoming government, which lacks specific representation or um, commitment to specific priorities as signaled by its uh, desire to, one, increase military spending and two, um, end the ban on offshore oil, oil, oil exploration um, and whether the, and the, you know, the potential foreign ministers um, are likely to be either Jerry Brownlee or Winston Peters, and we could speculate as to what their individual positions would be. But the broader trend is that it's clear that the officials um, are kind of breadcrumbing um, ministers towards engagement and, um, and with AUKUS. Um, and there's been a, a pushback from some leaders like um, Helen Clark and um, uh, Jim Bolger, uh, and, and not to the same level as Australia, where, where a whole range of you know senior spy bosses and PMs have all come out uh, accusing uh, um, you know, Albanese of selling sovereignty and and um, you know everything, the huge uh, financial expense to America. But there's this there's a little bit of concern and pushback. Um, don't think there's a good understanding. Like Oliver said, there's not a good understanding in New Zealand about um, what AUKUS Pillar Two might mean. Uh, the language of people that are opposed to it um, is primarily, and I'll just end with these couple of comments. Is one is that you know. New Zealand's involvement in AUKUS Pillar 2 would um, further undermine Pacific-led regionalism because it would embed Australia's, you know, Indo-Pacific-driven strategy in the region and, and New Zealand would, would get, like Australia, then act in bad faith in the region and not act as a conduit for Pacific priorities. Um, it, would, it would tie New Zealand much more closely to the other Five Eyes nations, which there is actually currently a bit of daylight in between. And if you look at the um, United Nations General Assembly vote on, um, you know, Palestine, for example, you see that there is actually a little bit of daylight there. Um, New Zealand's likely only wanted because of New Zealand's low military spending um, and strategic, you know, territorial insignificance in comparison to some other Pacific nations. Um, New Zealand's likely only wanted in AUKUS for its brand, but if New Zealand were to join, it would shore up AUKUS, which has uh, its own internal problems um, and could actually fail um, to one deliver the subs to uh, to Australia, for example, for example. Um, but New Zealand's presence in AUKUS would um, give it pro-Pacific credentials and um, and wash its nuclear non-proliferation problems because of New Zealand's own domestic anti-nuclear legislation. So it's a massive problem. Um, New Zealand would give AUKUS a, a smiley tick. Um, and for New Zealand, it's a very bad, I think well, my own view is it's very bad diplomacy because it would close the principal difference that New Zealand has from Australia um, in the region. Um, it would jeopardise its international standing um, and... And it's it's kind of view as a um, it's liberal international image and and support for Pacific priorities. So, you know, we should look very closely at what Australia is doing when it um, you know green and brown washes its diplomacy. A lot of that is taken straight from the New Zealand playbook. If New Zealand just follows Australia, like uh, Simon says, it risks its standing and and actual power in the region. Um, and I think that that's uh, that's kind of indicative of. Uh, New Zealand, if it continues not to stand up on wedge issues like Fukushima, like AUKUS, like a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, all of these things that Joe and others mentioned, that Pacific nations are increasingly frustrated at the metropolitan powers for dominating the forum and undermining genuine Pacific-led regionalism, New Zealand it will become irrelevant because it can't bully or buy its friends like Australia can. So, you know, the, I think the message, um, the message should be that there's a major threat if New Zealand joins AUKUS. But it's a spectacularly bad move. Um, so there is a there is a chance that we can resist it. Um, yeah. So uh, that was a much longer comment than I anticipated. <laughs> We're going on. Thank you, Marco. Uh, Joey, I, I I note as well that there was a, a comment in the question from from uh, Peace Movement Aotearoa, I think related to to New Zealand joining uh, AUKUS, and and it says uh, from time. From time, it was evident that Australia would be hosting B-52s. We tried to persuade New Zealand to raise it with PIF-SG and to encourage Australia to report it as a significant event Article uh, under Article 9.1. Uh, no luck so far, and even more unlikely with, the, with um, now your incoming government. 
Um, and just just a second comment, uh, joining AUKUS Pillar 2 would breach New Zealand's wider disarmament policy, um, not only nuclear aspects. Um, so thank you, uh, Peace Movement. Joey, um, you had uh, something to, to share? Yep, maybe just in response to, or not maybe in response, but the caution around trying to operationalize the TPNW within the route on a treaty, considering there, there, there is for some concern from, and this is maybe the perspective around uh, Peng's perspective, given it's, it's been working in this space with some of the test sites and you know victims and survivors of uh, nuclear testing in the region, uh, how some of them are still under colonial administration while others are in a compact uh, of free association uh, negotiation with with either the US administration or other third parties. I think there is caution given that um, it, it would be good to operationalize article six and seven, which speaks to the assistance, uh, the assistance given to victims and survivors, the need for remediation of, of the environment. And that where that is where responsibility comes in. Also noting that some nuclear powered states have not ratified the TPNW. Um, and I think the challenge for us in today's context with a rising nuclear threats, B-52 B sub powered submarine weapons or the dumping of nuclear treated water is that how do we work a treaty uh, such as the Rautonga Treaty to, to, to fit the current context of a rising threats, but also addresses legacy issues that have not been, have not been addressed. So we, we we don't have countries like Marshall Islands who are looking at other platforms outside of the region. How can we really st strengthen our bases or how can we review it? So there is this growing call to review the treaty uh, to fit today's context of, 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 of nuclear arising threats. Uh, so that's that caution where we, as much as we want to operationalize certain aspects of, uh, or, of or the TPNW, there are certain aspects that are applicable to the current context that we are in, but there is also this caution that nuclear powered states do not get away with it. They need to be, you know, had held accountable for the legacy testing issues in the region. The same could be called for AUKUS. It, it, we just hope it does not go into this securitizing the region and for peace, stabilize, stabilizing the region and ensuring peace, yet, it has a component of uh, of nuclear uh, powered weapons or powered uh, assets uh, in this compact. So yeah, just wanted to share. There's some caution around that, but I think there is, uh, as you can see, over um, Peeps, the Secretariat has been trying to review, and I think there are calls. If memory serves me right, the 2019 communique that acknowledged the need to review uh, the, the treaty to fit today's con uh, the, the current issues and the arising issues that the region is faced with. But I think it is a challenge that it's about time. This is, like I said earlier, and this is a treaty that really informed Pacific solidarity. And if it's one that we could prove to safeguard and ensure the protection of our region, uh, upholding a nuclear free region, yet addressing nuclear testing issues and holding those accountable uh, for previous or legacy testings uh, in the region, but also calling those out who bring arising threats. I think it, it will inform regionalism in a long way. Renaka, thank you. Thank you, Joey, uh, for that. Uh, were there any more comments before I... The, our audience is also welcome to, to ask questions of our speakers uh, this afternoon. Um, if, if may, I, sorry, can I jump in sure, just quickly? Sure. Thank you, and thank you, Joey. Um, it got me thinking and and um, appreciate the the input there and reminded me that I guess the, another, another sort of approach to this is to also broaden the frame um, by which we can sort of, I guess, undermine AUKUS itself um, by by looking that it's not it's not simply nuclear um, nuclear peace and nuclear security um, 
that that AUKUS undermines, but but a range of different priorities that have been very clearly articulated at the regional level, very clearly and very um, and repeatedly articulated. And and I guess maybe the most important among those is climate change as the single greatest security threat. And as Australia's single largest investment in security, how does AUKUS respond to the Pacific stated number one security threat? And and the simple answer is that it doesn't and in no way. And in fact, it, it actively undermines by um, continue to fuel fossil fuel intensive militarization. Um, and I mean, it, it really is sort of astonishing that Australia can sort of launch forward with a with a an idea that something like AUKUS can address Pacific security priorities when it, it undermines the single greatest stated threat that the Pacific um, has has identified. And I mean, the US military is the world's single largest consumer of oil. Um, and the, the sort of underlying logics of of producing um, the, the, not only the, the the submarines, but also sustaining the kind of um, infrastructure that's required and the investments, of course, across Pillar 2 as well, which we have so little um, so little oversight over, um, really do have a, a significant material impact um, on climate change and, and, and in, a, in a sort of less material way have uh, a significant consequences for multilateralism in, in, that's required to address climate change by fueling the kind of tensions between US and China and which which is so critical that the kind of international international collaboration that's needed to aggress serious action on, on climate change. Uh, I just wanted to say that I guess looking beyond nuclear stuff as well, there are there are so many pillars of AUKUS that that um are sort of rotten to the core that really need to be knocked down to try and sort of bring it down, I guess. So, so if they aren't, uh, thank you, Oliver. Uh, if there aren't any questions, I suppose something that uh, maybe we could get a comment from from either all of you or, or one of you from was was just in relation to this idea of this zone of peace that's been mooted by by Fiji's prime minister, given that AUKUS, um, uh, AUKUS and AUKUS Pillar Two in particular threatens to um, rope in um, other countries in the Pacific, in particular New Zealand. Um, and, and this erosion of this spirit of a nuclear free Pacific, how, how do you think a, a zone of peace might look um, in, 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 in this space? Why is that, Nipili? Sure. You know, we're invited to believe that the zone of peace is a Pacific-led initiative. Um, Prime Minister Rambuka's comments at the forum press conference was that he started by describing how, you know, the Pacific was named in uh, 1522 or something by Magellan as, as, as the Pacific and, and that we're a peace loving region. And that after the Vietnam War, the US led this kind of global peace initiative and, then, and he kind of alluded to the UN's new agenda of peace. And he left us with the comment that although the the idea of a zone of peace is not a Pacific baby. That was his quote. That you know it might grow to be one. The um, and then in the forum communique, we see that it has these links potentially with Boy and Pikatawa um, in the twenty fifty strategy, and you know it could be um, have these synergies with the idea of like a forum first security, um, and then there's there's like maybe a um, nature conservation um, component. Um, when Rambuka outlined his seven um, kind of point plan, when he when he fully articulated what well, to the greatest extent articulated the vision alongside Penny Wong and Canberra, um, I think that we all on this call know that um, the zone of peace lacks credibility. Um, it's it's a deeply securitized view um, that doesn't commit to disarmament in the region. It doesn't commit to nuclear non proliferation in the region. Um, it doesn't, you know, maintain principles of climate justice, um, and most importantly, um, doesn't look to provide independence for those people that are under occupation by colonial powers. So, the peace, um, you know, the, the the critique has been that that 
his vision is for a zone of peacekeeping, uh, which simply puts military might in the hands of Pacific people um, and neglects the Pacific's own expanded conception of security, which is based on human, act, um, human development and climate action fundamentally uh, in line with Boyd. Um, the other thing I would say is that, and I've long said that metropolitan nations have been using the language of climate justice and respect for indigenous rights to securitize the region. And that this playbook was actually developed um, in the eighties with respect to the, to um, support for a nuclear free Pacific. Um, this, the same is true of the zone of peace um, because the idea is that it would be compatible with uh, you know, the language and structures of uh, free and open Indo-Pacific, the rules-based international order, and language that has been used by the Western Alliance around a safe, secure, and stable region. Um, and these are all, you know, these are all symbolic terms that are used to signify alignment with, um, with you know, AUKUS and, and, and you, um, the upholding of US military primacy. Um, and Australia and also New Zealand believe that its interests are best served um, under that view, that rules-based international order. Um, and if we look at the way that, say, Australia operates in the region and, and things like the Black Rock peacekeeping humanitarian assist this disaster response camp, um, you know, by providing, by securitizing climate, um, by securitizing all of these issues, by securitizing instability in Pacific nations, which is fundamentally caused by the failure to address colonial legacy issues, under development um, and climate breakdown, uh, you know, they can proffer military solutions, which serves to align the region and construct a sphere of influence. So then we see that the zone of peace opens itself up to being a pacified sphere of influence, not simply a zone of peacekeeping. It is, it's, it's a, a compatible, but actually interoperable uh, with, uh, with the US Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, and as a self-styled apostle of peace, um, Rambuka, you know, his, talks about how he's committed to reform, but as Fiji and, and with its history of peacekeeping is, is, is well-placed to, to advocate that particular kind of, um, you know, a security and, and military application to, to the question of peace, upholding peace. My challenge to Rambuka and that would be to understand that um, in 87 that, that, there was another vision of peace that was curtailed in the regional movement um, and the nuclear free and independent Pacific outlined in the People's Charter, a credible vision for a Pacific peace, which didn't shy away from the hard issues of nuclear non-proliferation or independence or those things. And that that is our nation, uh, that our, is the civil society and Pacific um, vision of peace, not Magellan. Um, and that must be the basis for any credible zone of peace um, that that removes the Pacific as a zone of strategic competition um, and and promotes non non military solutions that are based on with people and so that's that's the comment I think on the zone of peace I think we should we should oppose the zone of peace as it is currently outlined because it quite frankly is AUKUS pillar three it's aligning other nations in the same way that pillar two would it's 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 very pernicious it's a very pernicious idea. Um, and yeah, so yeah, I think it's a Trojan horse. So yeah, we should we should be wary. Wary, yeah. Bilnaka <laughs> Mako. Um, uh, I note that uh, peace peace movement Atero has has commented and and mentioned that uh, the erosion of a nuclear free and independent Pacific in the current mad big power military rivalry marks um uh, marks any positive alternative of the. Treaty of Rarotonga unlikely, um, we think. It's the same with New Zealand's nuclear free zone and disarmament uh, and arms control legislations. It has several gaps, but any attempt to improve it is more likely to result in, in further weakening. Um, thank you, uh, Peace Movement. So, you know, given, given um, uh, uh, the, the, this discussion of the zone of peace and, and um, the role of us gathered here today as civil society. I wanted to perhaps ask our panelists, you know, given Australia's uh, increased militarization and AUKUS Pillar 2 and AUKUS Pillar 3 uh, coming in, uh, my final question or maybe second last question to, to you is, is how can civil society 
respond? What can we do in the face of these threats to, to the spirit of our nuclear-free region? Um, maybe, Apelli, if I could just respond to the previous question and sure. Sure. name Marco and please, I think I see everyone's admitted and please do feel free to engage in conversation. But earlier on, I think Marco highlighted uh, a list of possibilities that could um, co-op this, this current proposal by Fiji Prime Minister around a zone of peace. Um, and as much as we want to oppose, I think it's uh, it answers this question appeal is to for our civil society or us in the region is to reclaim it, reclaim this 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 proposal around peace. And I think for us in the region to attain peace or uh, establish fight for peace, I think it seeks justice. And I think there are some priorities that informs this zone of peace. I think the real issues, like Marco said, is the issue of climate justice, uh, which is a priority. The issue of nuclear justice, uh, which are priorities. There are There is a long-standing or long-outstanding issues such as with Papua and other issues that, that could really inform um, this proposal of what the region should be like, or what do we mean when we talk about peace and achieving peace or aspire to have a region uh, that is peaceful or to have peace restored. Um, the last thing we want is, or should not want, we, we, we don't want is Australia, uh, this running really well in terms of a, of a, of a security regional framework that informs um, peace, peacekeeping and all of this. And Marco clearly highlighted some of the facilities or the establishments that somewhat are already falling into place to inform such a, a proposal by the Fijian Prime Minister. But I think the challenge on, on us is call it out for what it is um, and, 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 you know, continue to reclaim that space and say, I think the, the region in terms of restoring or attaining peace in the region means different as to what external partners uh, want and how they want to influence the space. Thank you, Apelli. Nakajoi, uh, did did uh, we, we've opened the floor to 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 all our our, our guests joining us this afternoon? So you're welcome to to ask questions or make interventions as well uh, uh, during this webinar. Um, but but if there was uh, nothing, perhaps if if either uh, Oliver or Marco had anything further to add. I agree completely with completely with Joey, and I, I note in the in the questions to um, peace movement Aotearoa also said that you know maybe that requires us to create materials out, out re outlining restating the Pacific's what what a Pacific peace looks like and yeah um, a briefing paper maybe another webinar series who knows but there's there's so many historical precedents and um, and and a firm foundation that the NFIP um, created to to guide us so we wouldn't be starting from scratch which is fantastic um i guess i'd just feel in on what to saying i i mean, i've i've sort of you know through the research into this my sort of obviously understanding of it has been expanded significantly and it just it, it always impresses upon me that more knowledge is is always better about this and shining a light into some of those those aspects that that Australia and and like you mentioned Marco New Zealand would rather hide or stay hidden to in order to preserve an agenda um that can look good from the outside but but hide some really troubling um troubling aspects and and yeah I totally agree on the need to to continue producing work which which tries to raise consciousness around around that and yeah I, I love that you sort of pointed out that there are so many historical precedents to this and that you are you aren't starting from scratch there's so much inspiration to draw from um and that, that's a a really exciting and an important important um, note so thank you for that
thank you, uh, thank you, uh, gentlemen. I, I, I know that um, peace movement has has mentioned uh, a briefing paper. So, so perhaps as as maybe a, a, an action to take forward uh, in terms of how civil society can 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 maybe uh, address these uh, erosions and incursions onto our our nuclear free region. And and I like the point that Joey made around reclaiming peace. So perhaps um, this is where uh, an opportunity for civil society to to take charge of of the narrative and perhaps uh, harken back to some of the the civil society um, actions that that took place that led to the creation of this the Treaty of Rarotonga. Um, I suppose uh, uh, as as we sort of wrap up or well, draw towards the last ten to fifteen minutes. Um, and with no questions from our audience, uh, were there any, uh, I guess, closing reflections from our panelists uh, before we close uh, this afternoon's webinar? And, and don't all rush in to, to volunteer to go first. <laughs> My cat just caught a really big rat. Uh, um, uh, Thank you so much to Pang for, for organizing this and and the, the three webinars. It's it's been really wonderful to to respond in real time to you know the the, the have a civil society coordinated civil society response to developments in the region, um, and holding leaders to account and providing the alternative. So, um, big credit big credit to to Pang, um, um, and 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 thanks for the invitation. And um, sorry that Tale couldn't be here as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, maybe thank you, Marco. On. And uh, I, you know, I just, yeah, firstly just want to thank Oliver um, and Marco um, and, you know, for providing more meat to this conversation. Uh, for Oliver, you know, the briefing papers that you provided uh, provides more details on what AUKUS is and how it, you know, it, it's informing our region. And just really want to thank you for that. Um, I think moving forward, there are opportunities for engagement. Um, within the region, um, but also this does not stop or discourage or halt national progress on, you know, holding your governments account accountable, be it in Australia or New Zealand or here in Fiji. Um, we should continue to pursue this, this, this engagement with our leaders, be it on Fukushima, AUKUS, or legacy issues, uh, but how these different, you know, proposals around a peace zone should look like. The Rarotonga Treaty, I think, is going through a review committee, and I think there will be opportunities for um, submissions, but also an, uh, an opportunity to engage with the forum secretary as to how uh, submissions and um, the review process will take place. So th that's one process that our Pang is happy to continue to uh, coordinate that space, but also reach out to partners. Uh, the ongoing one, which is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, CPNW Second State Parties meeting will be taking place next week. Uh, I think that's one important uh, um, platform that some of 10 Pacific Island countries have ratified and are really pushing uh, to inform how best um, victim assistance, environmental remediation responsibility looks like. But I think there is this also big concern from Pacific Island member states around how do countries or yeah countries like French occupied uh, Polynesia um, and Marshall Islands who are not parties to the uh, to the treaty still benefit around victim assistance and compensation. So these are some conversations that are still taking place. Um, but yeah, in general, we'd like to keep this. Um, these conversations open. I see a proposal by Peace Movement Aotearoa. Aotearoa. Um, thank you. Uh, I think it, it's something that we could all pursue uh, collectively, but yeah, there are uh, opportunities that we can collaborate in terms of informing uh, the, the region on nuclear justice work. But yeah, just wanted to thank everyone and thanks again, Oliver and Marco. Thank you, Apelli.
Thank you, Jory, and thank you, Apelli, too. And thank you, everyone, for, for joining and listening as well. We can have a level. Okay. Uh, so we thank our speakers for joining us this afternoon and for those of you that uh, have also have listened in. Uh, again, those three briefing papers are available um, on our website, the link which will be emailed to all of you. Um, and if you would like a recording of this, of this uh, webinar as well, we'll be happy to share, share that with all of you as well. Um, so we wish you all the best uh, for your meetings ahead um, um, and uh, hope to see you at our next webinar. Stay tuned for Pang Socials uh, for an update on that.